a very, very warm welcome to everybody tonight and in joining us to meet Chris Cullen and Richard Burnett, two co-founders of MIST, and to hear more about where the journey began. Before I give a little bit of their biographies, in case anybody needs to hear that, just to say that the format of tonight, we couldn't let it pass without asking Chris to start tonight with a little settling practice. If we have time at the end, we will also have Richard actually closing today with a little bit of practice. And Chris and Richard, they thought long and hard about this and they really requested that this wasn't a talk, that they weren't going to come here and just talk at us and that what they would prefer is a series of questions and for it to be a bit more dynamic. And I will be part of that process asking them various questions. Of course, I've shared with them ahead of time the things that I'd love to hear the answers to. Uh, but please do pop your questions in as well. And, and I hope that there's a kind of flow to this. It's not just that we're asking uh, one question after the other, but that there'll be a, a dialogue between us. So what can I say about the two guests that we have? here tonight. I'm going to go to introduce Chris first, simply because I think for many, Richard will be a more familiar face um, than Chris, that in many ways, we're welcoming Chris back tonight. Uh, because Chris was involved right at the beginning, clearly as co-founder. And then as we'll hear in a moment, kind of went in a, in a different direction. And we haven't had this opportunity to come back and, and hear his reflections. So alongside being co-founder of Mindfulness in Schools Project, Chris Cullen also founded the organization Mindfulness Initiative. How amazing is that? He is a mindfulness trainer and psychotherapist teaching on the master's course in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy at Oxford University and working as a psychotherapist with Oxford University's counseling service and in private practice. Here's the key link. He's a trained secondary school teacher. He stopped teaching in 2010, but after 20 years in the classroom. And any formal work with Mindfulness in Schools Project also stopped a few years later in 2013. And, and I think we'll hear a little bit tonight. That was partly so he could pursue new directions and where his mindfulness journey was taking him. So as I say, I think tonight is a bit like welcoming a long-standing friend back and Chris's knowledge of MISP, but also distance from it, I think will be a fascinating combination. And now Richard Burnett, who in many ways doesn't need an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway, Richard. He is our co-founder of MISP. He is our current chair. And Richard is a teacher at Tunbridge School, where he brought mindfulness to the setting and unbelievably has taught mindfulness to well over a thousand adolescents. Having, well, living with one adolescent, I'm, I, I take my hat off to you, Richard, for, for training well over a thousand, as well as school staff and school parents. And he's been involved in so many initiatives, but in many ways, I think the one I'd like to highlight is is how through his TEDx talk, I, I think in many ways he helped to define the, mi the landscape of mindfulness and education in those early days. And if you haven't seen that, I'd encourage you to Google that, Richard Burnett TEDx talk. Though Richard is the chair of MISP, he wants me to point out that his responses tonight are very much his personal take, linked to being a co-founder rather than any official position as MISP chair. So enough of me talking. I know you will join me warmly in welcoming both Chris and Richard. And before we start any of the questions, Chris, would you kindly guide us through a short settling practice? Well, thank you so much, Emily, for that warm welcome. And uh, it's just lovely 
to to reconnect this evening and to see all your faces and just to add my welcome to each of you wherever you are in the world however you're doing today in this moment so welcome in our shared space and yeah why don't we just take a moment now before we we kind of proceed into some questions and reflections just to collect ourselves into the body of this moment and you might have spent the day in a classroom or behind a computer screen or countless other activities but just sensing in this moment what your body might need right now let's just take a moment for some stretching and yawning and shaking out and honoring what your body is asking for in this moment by way of movement and of settling. And it may be that standing is what you need for a moment or two, or just allowing yourself to land in your feet and your seat if you're sitting. And so really getting curious about the sensations of contact that your feet are making with the ground and your body with the chair. Taking a few moments, just really in the spirit of the dot of dot B, just to stop and ground yourself. And sensing this whole body that's standing here or sitting here, sensing how it's breathing as well. <clears throat> Sensing the movement of this particular breath. And seeing if it's possible to breathe with however this moment is for you. Whatever mood that's here, whatever thoughts that are here, whatever preoccupations or sensations. Breathing with and allowing this moment to be as it is, as best you can. And then maybe again, just a little movement as in due course, you let your eyes open if they've been closed or just come back into a larger awareness of the the room you're in that also contains the screen of your computer in front of you. Let me just carry on doing that, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you Let's so much for that wonderful start an opportunity just to yeah come back to this moment so i feel very privileged to start asking questions and get to ask the things that i've wanted to know for quite a while so i i'm guessing you weren't born into practicing mindfulness and teaching mindfulness although i may be wrong uh so i'm intrigued and so maybe richard we can come to you first can you tell us, and we'll come then to you, Chris, tell us how your journey with mindfulness began. Well, thank you, Emily. Thank you. And just to say, it is so lovely to see everyone. And Chris, it would have been lovely just to keep keep that going for an hour. Um, and I'm sorry if things that I say, people have heard me say before, because I probably repeat myself and tell the same old stories. Um, my journey began, I think, I guess, I mean, how do you know? Does anybody here know quite where their journey began? I'm not sure. It was, I think, in my early 20s, I was reading quite a lot of 
um, Eastern stuff. Um, I was quite interested in Buddhist psychology. I was reading people like Krishnamurti, people like Vivekananda, and kind of liked the idea of, of, of meditation. And then in my mid-20s, I actually got pretty pretty ill. I had a, a, something of a, a brush with mortality. And I think that really catalyzed me to think, actually, there has to be more to my life than what I was doing at the time, which was working for Unilever and selling super noodles. Um, and I thought it can't, this can't be what my life amounts to. Um, and so I became more interested and I went to a bookshop and um, I, the, the, the moment I always describe, I don't know to what extent you exaggerate these things as you, as you go through, but the, what I remember of it is picking this book up off the shelf, uh, Mindfulness in Plain English, and thinking, oh, that looks quite interesting, but then actually beginning to put it back, and then like something from a Scooby-Doo movie, one of those sliding doors moments, there's this little old lady next to me who sort of seemed to appear, and she said, actually, that, that's quite a good one. And being sort of British and guilty about putting things back, but okay, I'll get that, I'll buy that. So I bought that, and that really was what got me going. I think it's still a brilliant manual uh, of mindfulness, um, and it, I suddenly... I think I'd never appreciated or realized that that monkey mind, that chattering in the mind, which I probably still have, but which was so much defined my experience, my attention, wandering, chatting, worrying, thinking, overthinking, um, just that there was a way of stopping and sitting and stepping back and noticing and being aware of breathing. And I guess I I took to my breath very quickly and thought, oh, that, that, that helps. Um, and that just really, I guess I carried on with it because it it, it 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 seemed to be working for me, which was lovely. And then my daughter, actually, when I was in my late 20s, my daughter, when she was two and a half, was diagnosed with leukemia. And then two and a half years of pretty much hospital treatment followed for my family. And that I think that kind of embedded it because whereas it was always kind of maybe about me in my mind, you suddenly realize that in situations like that, you somehow need to find places that you can settle, spaces that you can dwell in that don't feel terrible. Um, and so I suppose that sort of the end, almost the first bit of my journey was sort of consolidated in that, in, in that period of time. Um, and I guess partly also that was being with children, sort of with mindfulness in my head, maybe, because I would, you know, go to the hospital and you know practice or sit with my daughter or whatever um so yeah I think that's probably mm. probably most of it thank you for sharing that Richard I, I I don't know whether that will come out tonight but I wonder how many of us have had have had things in our lives that have meant that we've gravitated to this it would be interesting to, mm. to explore and I didn't know that without that lady in the bookshop maybe you'd have been <laughs> championing noodles at this point know, so yes. i'm very grateful that she was there um Likewise. chris similarities differences how, how did your journey begin yeah I'd, I'd forgotten that richard about your uh journey and amy's illness and all of that it's really touching to hear about that again uh, i guess with that kung fu panda clip you have been championing noodles as well i think a bit um, <laughs> but uh yeah, I also I I kind of feel like I've always been interested in the mind and its workings and its depths and its potential. And I I read theology at university and did quite a lot on psychology of religion and then got into Christian contemplative prayer in my twenties and went on quite a few retreats with that and also then um, Buddhist Christian um, retreats and and hung out at monasteries, Buddhist and Christian monasteries, and, and it kind of grew from there. There was definitely the sense of, of finding what I'd been looking for, or finding a kind of ladder that I'd been looking for in, in discovering mindfulness. And at the time, I was, was a secondary school teacher and started seeing what it was like just to introduce a short practice at the beginning of lessons to to see whether that would help kind of settle the class and kind of settle me and get us kind of on focus and it was so interesting because it kind of immediately the kids really liked it and would complain if we didn't do it and if I said to them you know 
Okay, now close your eyes and put up your hand if you're using this outside class time. Almost all the hands would go up. And, and you know, that was just so kind of confirming of a sense of, ah, oh, this is something that it's not just me that could find this useful. This has got real kind of practical um, relevance. And, you know, it was about the time that MBSR and MBCT were really coming onto the kind of collective awareness here in the UK. And there was something so exciting about sensing how they were making available these, this kind of ancient, profound wisdom in a form that was so accessible and could be really, you know, accessed by, by people in, in very diverse ways across society. And so at that stage, I, I kind of, in the mid nineties, I kind of caught the, caught the spirit of the mindfulness movement and felt this tremendous excitement about it that was really uh, kind of mirroring what I was experiencing in my own you know, body and heart and life uh, in terms of a kind of transformation really that mindfulness can bring. Yeah, so. Thank you, Chris. And, and those early days that you were describing where you were with the Christian contemplative tradition, even Buddhist psychology, it, it was the essence of those experiences, I'm assuming, as opposed to any religiosity around that or it really was and that because I was also investigating Advaita and a bit of Sufi and it felt like oh these all have in common this sense of cultivating present moment awareness cultivating presence mm. and cultivating that capacity to be more present and available for our lives here and now and that felt like the you know the jewel at the heart of it all really mm. Mm. so you were you both we're beginning this journey or in different parts of it and then somehow you met and I don't think I know the story Richard yeah you want to say yeah well it was it, it I mean it, it just if I can just add to something Chris was saying there on the last of your point there Emily I think what was so interesting for me on that one was that I became a bit of a sort of a passing a junkie and did tons of 10-day retreats and really got into it and and stuff. But I didn't know actually, Chris, I think knew much sooner than me that all the secular stuff was happening. And then when I discovered these secular things, I said, oh my goodness, this is like incredible. You know, this is a secular language for all of these experiences and um, techniques that I've been using that I've been learning in one language, if you like. Suddenly there was the secular language for it. And that was really exciting, you know, with, with, with you know, John Kabat-Zinn's early work and then Mark and John Teasdale and people. That was such a, such a discovery. Um, so so we met actually at a well-being conference. We were at a, we were at a, um, a, a school's well-being conference in, was it 2007? I think it was. Yeah, yeah I, I believe it or not, I was clearing out some files the other day and I found the, the conference... <laughs> No and way. A piece of paper on which we wrote our email addresses. So You're kidding. Thank goodness we didn't lose that. So it was what? it was at about quarter past four on Monday, the 5th of February, 2007. I we... don't believe it, Chris. That, I literally, I've never heard that before. Chris, that's <laughs> one. You need to send me a send me a photo of that. I mean, it was really funny because we were at this conference and right at the end, um, or no, in the conference, Professor Felicia Huppert, who was the professor of the Cambridge Wellbeing Institute, she said I, I, she wasn't a, a meditator but she said oh I, i've been reading about this thing called mindfulness you know it's out, the research that's coming out it looks really amazing i'm really interested in this um and if there's and i quite like to test it you know in a school setting if there's anyone here that's interested and would like to help you know create something that we can test just stay behind afterwards and um and that's how we met we, we were the two people that stayed behind afterwards um and we got talking with felicia and we thought, right, how many, you know, she said, and then we met with her and then we sort of drafted the first version of a, of a curriculum to test. And to be honest, at that point, Chris and I thought, how many lessons can we get out of this in the sense that it seemed the idea of getting teenagers to actually properly practice. And Chris will come to this later, I think that, you know, we knew that the dosage couldn't be particularly high, but we wanted to create something that was fun, that was enjoyable. That, that, that captured their imagination a little bit as well and and then the results of that pilot were very positive and then that that moved us forward but it was just this stay behind afterwards moment which would have been probably quarter past four on February the third 2007 or whatever it was that that everything just began to 
to to to to take off, which was exciting. I I love that, Chris. In the process, presumably of <laughs> clearing out your files, you found this bit of paper, and now you have this anniversary. You can you can celebrate. And Richard didn't even. <laughs> That's wonderful. Uh, and and looking back at those early days, so when you you came together, you thought, okay, let's give it a go. Let's let's have a go at this. Was there a vision? Did you did you expect it to evolve in the way it has? As it evolved, just as you thought, i.e., you no know, surprises. Or if you pause and look back, yeah, what are your thoughts? Maybe maybe Chris, you could come to that. Well, you know what? I th I think we were very inspired by Felicia Huppert's sense. I, I again at that conference, she said, "You know, I've I've really got this hunch that mindfulness could be incredibly valuable in schools," and I remember f catching s some of that of her sense of possibility as a senior scientist at Cambridge University, and yeah, there was a sense that. Um, who knows where this could go but there was also this sense of this is an idea whose time has come this is an idea whose time has come this is as Richard likes to say this is actually nothing other than common sense and so you know I, I it really felt because it was at the time when a lot of research was being done about the importance of attention and just how much attention is the key both to you know our, our cognitive functioning our mental you know we could say our academic functioning but also our emotional well-being and that possibility that actually we could support young people to develop the skills to work with their attention to enhance their capacity for uh, agency with their attention and that that could really be incredibly helpful for, you know, for all the things that they're doing, because attention, as any classroom teacher knows, is what all learning is mediated through. And, and so this sense of actually the, there's a research piece here that, that is really highlighting that common sense experience we have that what we give attention to and how we pay attention really matters. Mm -hmm. So I think it did feel like yeah, who knows where this could go. But I think we also all felt, um, Felicia, Richard and I all felt, you know, this is something, this is something that's, uh, has got real potential in it. Richard, I don't know if that, if that. Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to say that I think what we couldn't have foreseen was just how much would happen after that, that a lot of which would have, you know, nothing to do with us. And that was so exciting. You know, the levels of innovation that we've seen in MISP, um you know we, we, we the, the 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 growing of i suppose there's two stages almost there's the growing of the curricula um sort of just, not just with pause b but also with dots more recently but then also a shift from that to looking at pathways and really acknowledging that there are many different pathways through to implementing mindfulness in schools i don't think i don't think we would have foreseen such a clear articulation of that that the team have done so brilliantly recently um i think i don't i think we would have i think it's always been very diverse in terms of even the earliest tests for people referral units um and inner city schools and rural schools but i think it's got even more diverse now you've got more of those types of schools but you've also got this fantastic international development which again i don't think we had any idea of i think i think i'm right something like 40 different countries people have come from it's actually been taught in chinese is it japanese dutch there's sort of there's translations of curricula and all of that was so so exciting and i guess i don't think we could have foreseen what just what a fantastic community would build around this venture not around us but around miss you know the hub the fact that you've got so much support from teachers who feel equally passionate about mindfulness that we've had and have still got, you know, sort of people leading the work in MISP and around MISP. There's like a di diaspora as well of the trained teachers who are just 
just fantastic and a sense of belonging and a sense of community. I don't think we had any sense that that would grow to what it's grown to, which is one of the most nourishing things I think about about being part of this. Yeah, I com completely agree with that. And just I'm kind of in awe, really, of what the, the MISP team have been doing over the last mm -hmm. 10 years. It's quite extraordinary what you've achieved and just the, the reach into different communities and different populations and this wonderful diversifying of curricular materials to different age groups. I mean, it's just fantastic, really fantastic. And as you say, Richard, that sense of of the, that we had at the early trainings and that it seems like has just rolled through the years of MISP's development of, of, of teachers who really get this and then take mm. it to the classroom and discover that the kids get it and the kids are enthusiastic about it. You know, and, and so many of the early research on, uh, you know, dot B was highlighting that the kids really enjoy doing this, you know, mm. as much it seems as the teachers do. And, and it's, that's, it's, that's just wonderful. Oh, I, I think probably the team are purring and hopefully our wider community and it, and it goes to show how helpful it is to have this conversation because I, I think there are many of us that are in awe of what you did and probably feel like we can never kind of live up to that and and hearing that that you had this idea and and Chris you're saying an idea whose time which has come is very very powerful and 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 that that idea rolls forward but actually how that's then been developed with others and and I'm sure there were others also in your early days that were supporting you on this and that that bit although it, although you were open it could go anywhere you didn't really anticipate that it would have all the permutations that it, mm. that it has now so so thank you it, it's it's it, that's really really interesting to hear right I'm going to ask a question that I'm going to give a little bit of background to because it might not be that everybody here is aware Emily just Wait, you do, you I'm not going anywhere yeah. I just it, I'm quite warm in here it, I've closed the windows because the because of the rain I was going to open a window so I'm not disappearing go for it because I'm, <laughs> I'm I think I'm going to post this one to not running you. away because of your difficult question <laughs> <laughs> no I'm coming to you Chris <laughs> oh no <laughs> so I've wanted to ask this question for quite a long time um as many of you will know, uh, a few years back now, some researchers from Oxford University and some other eminent places were looking for a curriculum, a mindfulness curriculum to test a hypothesis about the benefits of mindfulness for children and young people, particularly around mental health. And they picked your curriculum, Chris and Richard, they picked the .B curriculum the secondary schools and that was ob an obvious choice really because it was the most established curriculum it was really valued and had earlier research supporting its efficacy and as many in the audience will know already this became known as the myriad project it was funded by welcome trust and it had some surprising results including for the researchers which many of you will know the media seized the pawn for around 24 hours and it and it made my job as a fairly new CEO quite an interesting one. Now, Richard, you've shared your thoughts publicly on this, all, although as much as you feel you can share <laughs> it as the chair of Miss. And we'll share that, um, Richard, towards the end. We'll, we'll put a link up. I don't want to distract people by reading it now, but we can put that out if anyone hasn't seen that. But I wonder, Chris, particularly because you you know us well and you've also moved away, and I, I'd be really interested in your reflections on the research and its subsequent presentation. Mm. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Emily. And um, <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot that I could say about this. Um, but in brief, I, you know, I think it's really important to, to get clear about precisely what question the researchers were investigating. 
because it wasn't actually as you said just now it wasn't the question is mindfulness beneficial for children and young people although the fact is that the outcome data that they got clearly suggests the answer yes it is beneficial for children and young people, showing that the children who actually did the mindfulness practices experienced clear benefits. And what's more, the teachers benefited from teaching it and from learning mindfulness themselves. And what's more, the school environment benefited uh, from the introduction of a school uh, mindfulness program. So that wasn't the question. If it had been the question, the answer would have come out, yes, this is beneficial for those who actually do it and engage with it. But nor was the question, can mindfulness be effectively taught in schools using the dot B curriculum? Though again, the outcome data, if you look at it really carefully and look at, look at you know, what its implications are, it says, yes, mindfulness can be taught effectively using the dot B curriculum. And when it is well taught, the, again, the children enjoy it and they practice it for themselves at home. And so those two questions that weren't actually what informed the design of the trial, if you look at the data, it suggests, you know, that mindfulness is beneficial and that dot B is an effective way of teaching it. And of course, that's in line with the previous studies, research studies that have been done into dot B. The question, and I think Richard is absolutely right in this, is, is that they were investigating. If you look carefully at the design of the trial, it's really clear that the question they were investigating is, is mindfulness in schools scalable as a universal intervention? And the particular model that they, that the researchers chose was to take 650 teachers whose only qualification had to be that they'd not done any personal mindfulness training recently, nor had trained to teach mindfulness, yeah? They didn't even need to show any interest in mindfulness. And let's remember that the schools, the 100 schools, were given incentives, as happens on these trials, to nominate a teacher to take part who didn't even necessarily have to be interested in mindfulness, you know. And, you know, Liz Lord and the Myriad team just invested valiant efforts to hothouse these teachers in two to three months to establish their personal mindfulness practice, to train them to teach dot B. And then they were assessed on only their second time of teaching the curriculum. And I don't know about you, Richard, but I am really glad that my teaching was not assessed on the second time of teaching dot B or any of its predecessors within just a few weeks of establishing a mindfulness practice myself. You know, th that is, you know, it's perhaps not surprising that, that the Myriad team themselves said only a very few of the teachers could be rated as having really taught well. But the design of the trial meant that all the teachers, whether it was those few who were teaching it well, or those whose teaching was graded as incompetent, all of those results fed into the final outcome. Mm. And, you know, when one can, you know, for me, then it's not surprising they got the results they did for that big trial particularly as it's notoriously difficult to do big psychological research in schools and even some very famous international programs for mental well-being in schools score either no results or negligible results when tested in the realities of of secondary schools and so you know, viewed from with the wisdom of hindsight, one can see that perhaps there was a certain inevitability in that. And, you know, Richard also had the foresight to see that there were really serious kind of concerns that we had about the dosage levels. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, we did feel and we were persuaded by the researchers and it was that way around. The researchers persuaded us that, look, Previous 
research on dot B is really promising. Yeah. And this is a hypothesis worth testing. And you're getting constant feedback from teachers and from pupils that they really enjoy this. So, you know, this is just going to be a learning experience for us all was mm -hmm. how it's presented to us. And it has been. Um, it has been. I ha personally have some concerns and surprise about how some of the research team have spun these results, um, some but not all. Um, but I, I do think that, um, you, you know, this needs to be set in the context of the larger tra trajectory of research on the benefits of mindfulness, um, th th that is highlighting the benefits of mindfulness uh, with children and young people. And I really do commend um, Emily. I don't know if this you wrote the MISP webpage in response to Myriad, but it's it's excellent, as is Richard's piece, as is Catherine Weir's piece, who's coming in November, as you said. Um, she, she wrote a really good document for the Mindfulness Initiative that I think has to be read alongside uh, any of the press releases or, or information coming from Myriad. So I've taken a bit of a time on that because you can see that this is something that animates me. But um, mm. yeah, I, I, I really respect the um, steadiness and commitment that MISP has shown through this difficult time. And I think history will come to show that you've made the right choice. Thank you. Wow. Richard, I'm going to suggest that we that we that we post your thoughts on this. And that unless there's anything, anything really urgent you want to say to that bit. I just wanted to ask Chris again while we have him just to and I think that's fascinating Chris uh and and just to push it slightly further if I may given that Oxford University Welcome and others are multi-million in the case of Welcome probably billion organizations with comms teams and and MISP gave its curriculum and has a not even a fraction we, we can't compete with that any thoughts about how that messaging gets out there or or or, or actually should we not worry about that and just carry on doing the work that we're doing well <clears throat> i suppose two thoughts one is we've been through kind of hype cycles with mindfulness in general haven't we you know and i think a certain kind of just steady commitment to doing what you're doing as well as you can through all the ups and the downs i think that has served the larger mindfulness community well and um you know so that informed by your sense that, that you know teachers get when they introduce this to schools if you introduce it with with you know some experience and some sense of competence you get a sense how much the children benefit mm -hmm. the great american ornithologist audubon used to say if the bird and the book disagree trust the bird mm -hmm. and for me, that's something about, you know, whatever the research of Myriad might be saying, the reality in front of you as a mindfulness teacher in schools is that some of the kids benefit from this enormously. Mm. And let that keep your, you know, your heart inspired <laughs> to be doing this incredibly important work. This incredibly important work. Um, yeah, there may be something else that comes towards the end, but it, you know, the fact that MISP is committed to introducing, developing, and maturing practitioners in this really important field, I think, is just the way to go. Just the way to go. You know, we need a, a body of competent, you know, mature practitioners, and all of us who are teaching mindfulness are always in training. 
and it's a lifetime's journey and we teach from that mm. amazing thank you so much we could we could carry on i think all night on on that um but we can't we've got questions coming in so richard with your permission unless there's anything anything super urgent on that we will let your piece do the talking we will put that out on chat before people leave tonight um and move on so there's a there's a question in here about to you richard and, and mm -hmm. maybe actually this does link a little bit to myriad can you tell us in those early days were you looking to teach children and young people mindfulness in the same way as a traditional adult eight-week mindfulness mindfulness course or was it was it always about introducing or sowing the seeds yeah i mean 100 percent. it's been always about sowing yeah. seeds that that's what i found just very recently actually a little bit upsetting was one of the um sort of maybe more more profile high profile figures describing myriad as it describing the context of myriad as as a a, ther a mental health ther therapeutic intervention and we would constantly be saying we would constantly be saying within the team this is not a therapeutic intervention this is not a therapeutic intervention it was almost like a mantra because of course that was what mbsr and mbct were the idea with dot b was to sow seeds it was to introduce it and to just invite people to have a go and crucially enjoy it and remember it and all of the early trials the one thing i remember catherine saying look what you've done really well here is it's very acceptable very high acceptability which means kids just kind of enjoyed it yeah and that was the outcome we were always looking for and that's very different in myriad because Myriad was using, well, there's a hundred reasons why it was so different in Myriad. But the bottom line was, they had, you know, our hope was, and I hope there are many people here who have experienced this, if you've been teaching it, that you might get that email in 10 years time. I'm still getting emails from people that left 15 years ago saying, you remember that stuff you taught us? Where can I get more of that? You know, and people, some people using it in completely different contexts, some people using it for, you know, yes, mental health, but other people using it for, you know, in the relationships at work, in sport, in music, in, in creative arts, just so many ways that mindfulness can be applied. The key word is possibilities. It's always been about possibilities and making, helping children to be aware that there is this thing. And what you want is when the word mindfulness comes up in their head later, you want them to have a little glow of, oh, I remember that. That was when we fell asleep in the lessons. Or that was when we did this. Or that's when we have fun. Or that's when such and such said this. Really positive, heartwarming experiences in the classroom. This is not a normal class. Let's enjoy this. Let's have a go. Let's be curious. Let's play. Um, and I, I worry that that, was, that can be lost as the framework, the context, the scaffolding around mindfulness in the adult world is so um, can be so tightly around mental health that the breadth and the beauty and the fullness of mindfulness is lost. And that's where the seeds have to be sown, right across it, not just down a narrow sort of mental health avenue. Mm. Fascinating. And that links to another question that's just come in. I'm going to say it slowly so you've got time to reflect on this. So your experiences of this and MISP over these since 2009, what are the implications of MISP's experience for the purposes of education? What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? Has it, has it changed since you've been involved with MISP? What what is the MISP's experience, the implications of that for the purposes of education? Chris, can I come to you? Well, <clears throat> I think where I go with it is, is to Richard's sense of possibilities and um, giving children and young people the the sense of agency to be able to find what they love and what they're good at and really take it as far as they can and you know that that sense of education is as as drawing out those possibilities from these these young lives and 
and that you know learning to pay attention to ourselves to our bodies and our hearts and our minds is how we kind of activate those seeds you know or or uh, become aware of seeds of possibility within ourselves um mm. and you know our, we live in such an attention deficit culture and such a disembodied culture in so many ways and mindfulness as a kind of recollecting of oneself into one's body and heart and mind and lived experiences um you know just the the preeminent way that i've i've come across to to get to know oneself more deeply and to access those seeds of possibility mm. that's a the first stab at mm. I'm impressed. Like you didn't have much time to think that one through, Chris. Very profound. And Richard, anything you'd like to add to that? Or we can go to the next. There's, they're coming in thick and fast. So no, I think I can't. I can't sum summarize that any better than Chris has. I think that's right. It's about. It's about. You know. Again, as John said, mindfulness is about being alive and knowing it. You know, and that that is not what much of our education system is geared towards doing it's geared towards results and you know it's it's metrics which have nothing to do with the child's heart and, and i think mindfulness can touch that heart and open that heart in a way which empowers them and gives them choices mm. and thank you we've we've had um somebody share from john covet zinn that who says we do not know what specific knowledge our children are going to need 10 or 20 or even five years from now because the world and their work when they come to it will be so different from ours what we do know is that they will need to know how to pay attention mm. how to focus and concentrate how to listen how to learn and how to be in a wise relationship with themselves including their thoughts and emotions and with others yeah, yeah. thank you thank you community um, another question here is we we touched at the beginning about how you began your mindfulness journey. Some interest to hear about well, where are you now? What what's what's alive for both of you now? Richard, do you want to say something? Yeah, I'd, something I'd love alive? to. I mean, what's alive for me now? What's alive for me now is, is very much the classroom. I I I went into senior management. Um, for a few years and just missed being with children in classrooms teaching and so what's alive for me at the moment is I, I'm just back in the classroom and, and just loving being in the classroom tomorrow periods two three and four I'm teaching um, dot B to year 10 it'll be very different to how I would have taught it you know 10 years ago but that is exciting and it's that I just feel completely alive and at home when I'm with kids in class. I just find them endlessly. They give me energy. Their energy gives me energy. And I just, I just enjoy that. And then the other thing that I'm really excited by is, is a sort of, I've had a story ticking over in my head, um, kind of uh, just to just, it's my way of processing the complexity of having mindfulness in a, in schools. Schools are so complicated and I suppose I've got characters who are doing mindfulness for different reasons and teachers who are teaching mindfulness for different reasons. And the only way I can process and understand and begin to understand my own interpretation of that is to sort of create those characters and, and, and make them collide and sort of see what happens. And, and so for me, storytelling is the way that I'm finding um, freedom in exploring all these complexities because it's so complex kids are complex teachers are complex schools are complex but they're also in amazing places amazing I didn't know that Richard and <laughs> and you've reminded me that you know that's one of the things that struck me about Miss in the beginning was and you can hear it you know you're our chair and, and others on the board as well as in our team and obviously our associate trainers the teaching experience and, and, mm. and teachers helping to inform and the fact that you're going back even more into that Richard is 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 really really inspiring for us I think Chris what's alive for you and and particularly perhaps around yeah mindfulness where's your journey taking you mm -hmm. um well um to be very honest just right right now or today there are kind of two things alive one I'm still kind of a, a bit uh 
in the aftermath of a really amazing event in Parliament last week. Richard and I have both been very privileged to have been invited to be part of teaching mindfulness courses to, to politicians in Parliament. And last week, a week ago, they had a, a an evening um, that was marking the publication of a report into their experiences of of learning mindfulness over the last 10 years and 300 members of parliament in the UK parliament and 800 members of staff have done my some kind of mindfulness training in the last 10 years many have taught been taught by Richard and myself as well as others and just hearing their uh accounts of the benefits they've experienced and in some ways there's a lot in common with teaching teenagers you know as well as the kind of bells and playground behavior at prime minister's questions there's also it's a, such an attention deficit culture and it's so hard to get the buggers to do any home practice you know and so there's a lot of kind of micro practicing there's a lot of dot b equivalent and you know i'm very glad that um that myriad wasn't measuring trait changes in parliamentarians after the courses that we we did because for the same reason that actually it's more about how they deploy mindfulness and that that any trait changes build up would build up over a long period of time and it's taken some of them 10 years really to of practice and they really now speak with a a sense of experience about it um but it was very touching and again they were making connections with children in the schools in their constituencies because so many MPs learning mindfulness intuitively had a sense of oh, this could be so helpful to kids in those schools in my constituency or that pupil referral unit. So I'm partly with that and also just I've spent the last six days on a, a, a trauma training and um, training in somatic experiencing, which is a very um, body-based and mindfulness-based somatic experiencing is a kind of is an equivalent term to mindfulness about trauma and you know what it left me more convinced than ever about the importance of providing opportunities for children and young people to learn mindfulness skills of self-regulation because you know this is a time of multiple intersecting crises and there's a sense of trauma sometimes just ambient, isn't there, in our culture? And who knows what's going to come? And what, what we can know, rather in the spirit of John Kabat-Zinn's quotation, is that mindfulness is going to be essential as a, a tool for self-regulation, mm. a tool for learning just to manage our own reactivity, and, and open our bandwidth to respond rather than just react, you know, in in whatever's in whatever is coming. And so, you know, that was a very powerful reminder of, you know, indirectly of the importance of what MRSP is doing and what you, all of you who are teaching children, I mean, thank you, because our world really needs you to be doing that. Mm. Those children really need you to be making that as Richard Richard said, putting that in their awareness, even if they don't practice now, you know, for them to know where to look when they need it. So mm. yeah, those are what goodness, I, goodness, like. goodness. If if people weren't motivated to begin with, I I can't speak for everyone here because we're not unfortunately all physically together. But I looking at the time, sadly, we're going to bring this to a close very very shortly. But I. I'm pretty sure that any of our community and anyone here tonight or early in the hours of the morning, wherever you are, couldn't have listened to that and failed to have been motivated and to carry on the the fantastic work that is going on. And that and I think particularly those reflections from Myriad, it, it has been a hard knock. Uh I think we will carry that, Chris. And thank you for all the questions i'm sorry we haven't been able to answer all of them i hope chris and richard we can come back to you on some of those and we'll find a way hopefully to get that out for those of you that need to leave just before you go thank you team you're going to put that we're going to try the technology with the with the fundraising and also richard's reflections there because we didn't give him time to speak to that um so there's a fundraiser 
there, Richard's reflections just coming through now. If anybody can stay for a couple of minutes, don't worry if you can't. This was billed to finish at eight. But I wonder, Richard, I definitely would really value closing with a, a short practice and kind of marking this uh, special occasion and really uh, heartwarming and and motivating session from you both. And just thank you so much before you do that, because I think we can just kind of drift off into our evenings. Thank you so much for giving your time. And thank you everyone here for attending. Uh, and of course, the wonderful MISP team doing all the work behind the scenes. So yeah. Richard, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, Emily. That 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 would be a, a, a privilege and thank you. And um, I suppose it, it, it would, I wanna thank everyone for being here and really actually turn the um the evening towards you actually um so just finding a posture that you're you're comfortable in for for a few minutes and just finding the home for your attention for some people that's their breath their breathing for some people it's the hands it might be sound but settling attention however you feel comfortable doing so you know you know what to do here and just to reflect on a question what have you heard this evening that means something to you that is connected with you that has just caught your attention not just in your mind but in your heart it might be nothing to do directly with anything one of us has said it could be it's it, it, it it's reminded you of something it's it's you felt something shift slightly for whatever reason but bringing to mind if there's one thing that you really cherish in your work, in what you're doing, in how you are. What is that? What is that? What is it that you cherish and continue to find nourishing in your practice? And as well as sort of naming it, if you like, really feeling it in your heart and in your bones. Why does this thing that we've been calling mindfulness, why does that matter to me? And then finally, what can I do to sustain that going forward? You know, it's a bit of a cliche that you can't pour from an empty cup. Um, but it's, you know, there's truth there. What, how can you safeguard, how can you look after yourself as we go forward and do the work that we're doing? For which, again, I am so, so grateful for the community that's grown up around this. I'm just breathing that and feeling that. Okay. Um, well, thank you, everyone. I know we've overrun a bit, but um, Emily, thank you to you and for for and, and to the whole team behind the scenes here. I know it's looked very very smooth, but I know there's a lot of work that's been going on behind the scenes. And actually, just thank you to the to the MISP team because you know it's a privilege to be the chair of MIS, but the the work is being done with you and your team and it's just it is fantastic work and as you say any any support that can be given to that we'd, we'd, we'd love thank you so much thank you for that practice Richard and we do stay on a little bit if you want to um get the details of Richard's post as well as uh, find a way to to donate 
even small amounts you'll you'll lift the team you'll lift the team because we we'll, we'll feel cheered on um and i i think in a moment perhaps we can even unmute in a moment and we can just actually hear people's voices as, as we drift off into the night or into the early hours of the morning wherever you are and also don't want this to sound like a big loving but but Richard and Chris I, I think for those of us that are incredibly fortunate to earn our livelihood from this that mm. would not have been possible had you not had this uh idea and put it into practice you know I I and the team are also really grateful that with all its challenges we get to to try our utmost to try and work with this the magic of it and and to and to introduce as many young people and teachers as possible and and going back to what you said Chris none of us know what the future has in store but we do know <laughs> challenges are on the way and 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 equipping ourselves and those children and young people with that ability to come back to the present moment uh, for me has to be part of the solution so thank you so much we'll mm. end there